Okay, it says I'm live. Hello, my friends. Welcome to season four, episode five, which is the live show. We always do five live. Um, I'm trying to just check and make sure about chat. So let me try and type something. Ooh. All right, if anybody else is watching and would like to chat, try saying something and we'll see if <laughs> it shows up on my, over here. Anyway, um, here we are today. I'm in a different room than usual because it is a gloomy day um, and this is giving me the best light. So today, episode five, we are talking about Enreathed. I'm gonna grab the Enreathed cowl um, because that is the sweater we're working on this season. And here's my finished and wreathed. Uh, and we're talking about color work. Um, and I'm working on a second, before I get into it, I'm working on a second piece. This is gonna be called The Heart Wants. This is the cowl. And this is the almost finished sweater. Oh. Yes, that is the front. Still needs a collar. It needs a good block. You can see it's sort of lumpy. Um, and it needs, to finish off the second sleeve. So that is where I am with mine. That doesn't mean you should be anywhere like that with yours. Um, and all right, so I thought I would now get on to questions. I got some great questions from people uh, about mostly about color knitting. And I'm gonna start with Christine's. Christine had a few great questions. Hi, Christine. Um, First question was, what is color dominance exactly for color work and how important is it to be consistent with how you are carrying the two colors? So color dominance um, is where, okay, no matter what, your two colors are not going to make exactly the same size of stitches. So one is going to dominate over the other. And one is gonna recede a little. Um, I don't know the, I can't give you like exact scientific um, amounts because it really all depends on how you're knitting at the time. Um, the more comfortable you get, generally the less dominance there should be, but it also depends on how you do your color knitting. Now I um, eventually took a class and uh, knitting. So um, Two color, sorry, two color with two hands. So I would do uh, throwing, which is my usual method of working with my right hand. And then I would tension the second color and um, do continental uh, or picking. And so it's great when you can do it, you get both hands together. And I'm gonna do next week, I'm gonna do a demonstration video uh, as part of the episode. It's a little more complicated. It's a multi-camera setup, so I can't do it live. Um, and yeah, it, it's just a little more complicated to show everything. But basically what you're doing is you're doing both of those. And then um, the added part of the technique that I loved learning was trapping colors, um, which is when you have um, a stretch that's longer and then, then like five or six stitches and you need to carefully trap that, or you wanna hold that second color. Um, uh, and I see, Kelly, I see your question, um, and I can kind of get into it a little, but okay, so you you trap that color to, um, so that the float isn't really long. And I'm gonna kind of be all over the place because I'm getting into the floats question. This is the back, wait, let's do the back of Enreathed because that's the one that you're probably working on right now. So we saw the front, it's a pretty picture. This is the back, these are the floats. And in fact, I think this is where the, uh, the color change happens, it's the change of round. So you see these floats are these stretches of yarn and you'll see here, I'm stretching it a little, it does stretch. I can tell on my hands that it stretches more um, between, let's see, between the colors, between the color bands. Um, Losing my train of thought. Uh, the two. Oh goodness. Okay. Shoot, I totally lost my train of thought. Okay, let me get back to color dominance. So with color dominance, one hand tends to make one color be just ever so slightly 
um, to feed out maybe a little more yarn. And so that color will kind of push to the fore and the other color will get pushed to the back. And it's really something that comes with practice. The thing to do um, to sort of balance out color, uh, color dominance is to be consistent. So if you are always picking up your second color, your CC, your gray, in my case here, um, always pick it up with the left hand and use that for consistency and always do the blue in the right. Because if you're changing, um, it really does, it can make a difference. And that's really the thing is to just be consistent to always pick it up with one um, and the other color with the other hand if you're doing two color knitting. Now, if you are doing two color knitting on one finger, some people can do that. They can train the yarn for one off of one side of your finger, or they might do one with the pointer and one with the middle finger. Same if you're doing the picking. Um, you still want to be consistent because that's really the big thing is that consistency will, um, will help mitigate your color dominance. It won't, because otherwise I was looking this morning, I was trying to find there's a somewhere in a book by Elizabeth Zimmerman. She talks about how she didn't do, um, she switched hands while making some socks for her husband at one point. And you could tell, you could see the difference between the two. So I'm going to see if I can find that. And if I can, I will post that um, later, probably on Instagram. Um, but so that's the thing about color dominance. It really helps to be consistent, to carry the colors the same way all the time so that your whole yoke, unless you're doing it all in one go, you know, you want to remember which was which. And I tend to, because I am a th thrower, I tend to always put the, the MC, the main color in on my right hand. And then my CC over here on my left. I suppose sometime I should try, maybe I'll do some mittens and switch and we can see. Uh, I haven't had a chance to do that. Mostly because I haven't knit too many mittens that I've completed both of. <laughs> okay, so that's sort of the basics of dominance. Um, it really is just a matter of consistency. Okay, and then Kelly asked, how do you knit with three colors and how do you hold the yarn? So with three colors, it's generally um, to use a sort of what's become a computer programming term, it's deprecated. Um, most designers will say, I don't design with three colors in a row because that's hard. Um, and I haven't done that. I mainly do two colors, you know, just two colors, or in the case of a poncho, a design that still has to be put out, it's only ever two colors in a row. If you're doing a third color, I would imagine, I would probably do the, still the main color in my dominant hand and then work on training myself to be able to, to manage the two colors on two different fingers, probably in my non-dominant hand. So for picking, I would pick either one or the other. I think that would be, I think that would make the most sense. The other way to deal with that problem is to do the two sort of biggest colors, the two colors that have the most stitches, and then to go back later and Swiss darn or, um, or embroider over the spots, because presumably it's usually like your main color your CC1, your first contrast color, and then little blips of the second contrast color. So that might be an easier way to handle it um, without stressing yourself out. Because when you are doing two color knitting, tension, like your gauge, um, how you're feeding the yarn really makes a difference. And you can see it in the row, like it can be really tight. And that's why I recommend doing a bigger gauge swatch like a cowl rather than, I don't have an example really, but but to do you know like just a four or six inch wide gauge swatch doing that in the round you tend to pull tighter so um so if you're new to the technique i would practice i would practice on a cowl um if you want to master that kind of three color knitting um the bigger circumference you're going to be able to relax more and um and that gets me to the next question uh, Christine asked about 
how do you know if your floats are loose enough? And that's the thing about that working in the round on a small circumference, your floats, which are the threads, can you see that? That's a float. That's a loose bit of yarn and I'm gonna, and it's going from here to here. So you can see that there's a stretch there of quite a few stitches. I wanna say that's five if I recall correctly. Um, and you need that gray yarn, the yarn not in use, to float across the back, to to not, and, and that's where you can get, and if you pulled it tighter, it would make a little bunch and it would pull this fabric in and it would be uneven. So again, I'm sorry to say, it's practice, 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 really will make the difference on your floats. And um, the thing about floats is that in knitting, in general, when you stretch yarn across the back, you can always tighten it up. So if you make your floats really generous, like they're floating, they're, they're sort of bowed out from the back of the fabric, like there's so much yarn, you can tighten that up. You can go along like with a crochet hook, or I like to use, you can't add more yarn that doesn't exist in that round because um, you've, you've made it really tight space between the stitches, between, you know, here's one gray and here's another gray and there are five blues in between. Um, what you want is to have it be floating, to have it be more open and that way the fabric stretches, okay? This is pretty loose, I can stretch it. Look at that, you can see how it, um, how it flexes. I don't think, I don't have anything that's even tighter. I think this is even pretty, I'm proud of this. Um, because it's it's a smaller stitch gauge um, that it's still pretty loose. So the thing to do is to stretch your stitches out on the needles. Unfortunately, I'm not working the color work portion right now, but I can sort of explain it to you. When you are working along, you know sometimes we get everything all bunched up because we're going to do all this work. So the thing to do is find to have it bunched up on the needle that you're working from, um, from you know from your left needle. But when you get over here and you've got two strands, you want to stretch the stitches out, the stitches that you've just worked. Have them take up a lot of space on the needle. And that way, you know, you've got, let's say I've got my pink over here. This is one, two, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so we'll pretend this is where my pink thread was. And the next stitch is gonna be pink. So I'm putting it through. This is my, uh, all right, it'll be my CC. <laughs> so if, there's a hair there, excuse me. Ah, if the stitches are close together here, okay, this was, this was my stitch that we identified. Then the thread here would be pretty short. It would be just like my finger. But if we spread them out, the thread is coming along here and it's bigger. And you will get, you will have, that's what makes it float. So I will show this more um, next time when I think I'll be able to set up the camera sort of over my shoulder and looking down so you can really see um, how that works. But that is my number one tip for making sure your floats um, are floating is to stretch those stitches out on the needle. That's what works for me. I know that some people um, work, they, they flip the knitting inside out and they're working on the outside rather than having this, you know, like the stitches, um, your thread, your yarn coming from the back and the inside of that tube. You can flip it around and work basically on the outside of your knitting. And I think I've done it, I did it by accident a really long time ago. Um, when I was first learning how to knit, I remember my, my baby was, my 14 year old baby was not even born, I think. I was making some, some uh, little mitts. And I ended up with DPNs and I had my working yarn coming off the back of here. And you, you will just, it, it doesn't make sense intellectually, to be honest, um, but when you're doing it, it makes sense. And you can just, you knit around and that having the floats be on the outside of your work stretches it just enough to um, 
to give that extra bit of tension. And the funny thing about knitting is that it's those little tiny bits, you know, when we're talking about color dominance and we're coloring, you're talking about the tightness or looseness of your floats, um, it's, it's very tiny bits of yarn that make a difference. So um, those are my two bits of advice on floats is to stretch out the stitches along the needle and for that, I think working with a circular needle rather than DPNs, it makes it a lot easier. Um, and then if you're still not, if it's still really tight, I do recommend trying to flip the knitting essentially um, so that you're working inside out. You, I think you end up working like, instead of on the front of the tube, okay, I've got my needles here, you end up working with the work <laughs> so with this in front of you and you're working here if that makes sense so it would be like if i turned and was working backwards now you wouldn't want to turn and work backwards if you are flipping it inside out i think you can actually bring the tube of fabric through the needles like a magic trick and then just hold it and continue going the way you were before but now you've got the floats on the outside but that can really help um, especially if you're doing a smaller circumference. I know a lot of people who do um, stranded sock knitting or mittens will flip and work it inside out because it just it makes such a huge difference. Um, okay, we did floats. Cheryl asked, how do I keep my yarns from getting tangled all the time? This is a classic. Um, it can... Uh, be really frustrating to have multiple strands of yarn coming off your knitting and you've got it all jumbled up in your knitting bag. The number one thing I recommend, and I recommend this also if you're doing um, not stranded work, but if you're working with two strands of yarn, you know, just carrying them together along, um, is to put each in a separate Ziploc bag that's about the size of the yarn you know, so if you've got like small little 50 gram balls, you might be able to use like a sandwich bag. Um, a bigger skein of yarn, a bigger ball might require like a quart size bag, but um, put it in the bag, zip up the zipper most of the way, leave like maybe an inch or so and thread the yarn out of that little hole. And then they're separately contained. And um, so that's the first part, just like actual physical containment can help a lot. Um, and they're not getting tangled. And then the other thing is to, um, for me when I'm doing two color knitting, if I'm all settled on the couch and I've got my little spot, I have my main color over here with my right hand because I'm gonna be throwing that. And then I actually physically put the other color over here on my left side because I'm gonna be um, picking that. But then I've got, my tails are far away from each other and I've got knitting bag like this. Um, but as you can see, I've got, got a Ziploc bag. I'm done with the color, you know, with the two color portion. So I can put this away. But um, there's my, my main. But that really helps. And the thing about two color knitting is that you don't have to worry as much. I find if I'm doing two color knitting, I'm doing stripes working flat I need to make sure I'm always bringing up the other color from underneath so that there's not a hole and actually sorry that, that can be either flat or in the round you want to be sort of consistent if you're striping colors um, along that change point which is uh, either the end of the, the row or the end of the round but if you're working two colors in stranded color work across the way you don't really need to worry about that and I think that's another thing that you might find that you, um, you continually twist them around each other. But if you're doing two color work, you don't really need to worry about that as much. The other thing, of course, is you can always like pick up your yarns or pick up your thing and, and just hang it untwisted or just sort of unbarber pull the, the colors when they're getting together. Oh, this has been on my lap and it's warm because it has a packet in it. So, Really my best advice on controlling your yarns is actual just physical control, like physically separating them. And that also, if you've done that and they do get twisted, like you, you know, 
turn the work around um, because you're working around and around, it's e easier to then just physically untwist them, like pick up one color and just unwind it from around the other yarn. That's really kind of the safest thing to do. Okay. We did our floats. Oh, I'm the other part of float. Christine asked, said, I try to keep my floats loose, but then my first stitch of the color is wonky. And I wonder if that might have to do with uh, the handedness of the knitting. Um, I often find when I try, I'm a thrower, thrower like this, and pick her over here. Um, when I try to start off picking, I sometimes find those first few stitches are a little wonky. Um, so that may be part of it. And I wanna go back to things I've talked about a long time ago and on and on and on is that, you know, you are the boss of your knitting and, and you should be worried less about individual little things and more about the grand picture. Because I think a lot of those wonky stitches will block out when you actually end up blocking them. Um, let's see if I can even, I'm trying to find the spot on this towel where did the color change? It's probably, there's a tail. So it's probably in here, in this stretch here. Can you see, can you tell any difference? I can't really. And in blocking, especially if you are using um, natural fibers uh, or a majority of natural fibers that it will really block out. Um, it will get very smooth and relaxed. And of course I'll be doing a blocking episode um, a little further on. Blocking is in this episode 11. Um, and then we'll be talking more about giving your fibers a bath. But definitely um, those first few stitches might be a little wonky, especially the very beginning of the color work um, because you're just getting going. And you can always also, when you're weaving in your ends, um, carefully do it and carefully sort of tighten up that stitch um, that's beginning your color at the very beginning. And that, um, and then weave in the end, but like make sure it looks kind of smooth. Um, it's kind of amazing the work you can do after you're all done with knitting. Um, the thing I'm enjoying about doing these sweaters top down is that I don't even have to do the Kitchener stitch um, with the provisional cast on stuff that I'm going to show you in a future episode as well. Uh, you can provisionally cast on the underarms and then when you go back and do the sleeve, these stitches will woven together at the end. Um, because we put them on a waist yarn, put the sleeve stitches on waist yarn, and then at the end we have to match them up together. But I was talking about finishing. Oh, but there are things you can do in finishing. Like I've said, if you've got those loose floats and you find a a spot where like it's so loose that the stitch looks distorted, you can use a blunt tapestry needle and just gently, I would, you know, gently pull tug at this, um, like at this float on the back to tighten up the stitch so that it gets all smooth in there. Okay. You really can go and do that. And especially if you're not having to worry about Kitchener stitching your underarms, you've got more time to be careful about weaving in those ends. And of course, this is all these two colors. So I just back and forth. Um, if you're using multiple colors, I've also thought about doing this with a rainbow set of rainbow minis. Wouldn't that be amazing? Like on gray or pale blue, like sky or, or, or a creamy background um, to do a rainbow of hearts uh, is kind of my idea for another one. Um, but this is, this is the yarn that I had in my stash and I really wanted to knit it up like this. But if you have all those different colors, um, definitely you know break the yarn between stretches and then you can uh, manipulate those beginning stitches in terms of uh, smoothing them out. So I hope that makes sense. Um, then <laughs> uh, Christine says, I swatched, I swear but my sweaters always grow a bit in length and end up longer than I anticipated, especially with fingering weight sweaters that tend to be knit at a looser gauge. So part of that is um, swatches are lying liars. I, yeah, I've said it before. 
Um, I've, I've been burned on occasion um, where things just ended up a lot, ended up different than I expected based on the swatch. Um, because again, that's, it's those little micro bits of fiber though um, that when you're measuring your swatch, I'm gonna grab my swatch for this sweater. So here's my original swatch. And let's see. <clears throat> but this is my swatch, okay? This is only this, this big. It's pretty small. So when I'm comparing this to this, and I measure the stitches on here, and I say, okay, I'm getting, and I'm pretty sure I'm getting, and I even try to, you know, measure fractions of a stitch. I'm getting, I think it's 11 stitch, 11 rows, we'll say, because we're talking about sweaters growing, and they usually tend to grow lengthwise. Um, I'm getting 11 rounds uh, to the inch. Well, it could be 10, it could be 12 when you really get down to it. So um, unfortunately, swatches can't give you all of the information. Um, and that's one of the reasons that I like knitting a sleeve first, which is harder. I uh, didn't do it for these top-down designs um, because I'm really, I'm more concerned about um, length in, the, in the, the sleeve or in the body. And I can always, the good thing about working top-down is I, I could go back and undo the cuff and make it shorter if it got really long. Um, so that, that is an argument for doing top down because you can, it's less sweater surgery if you need to. Um, but where was I going with this? About swatches being line wires. And I like doing a sleeve first when I'm working bottom up because a sleeve is a good long stretch of knitting. You can then block it and stretch it out and sort of give it its most because we know that fibers do tend to grow a little. Um, and that's also your fiber choice is gonna make a difference. This has some alpaca in it. So I am a little concerned and that's why I made my sleeves a little on the short side because alpaca, as I think I talked about before, it's these long hollow tubes and alpaca just tends to grow and stretch and be smooth and long. Whereas wool is all jumbly and can sort of lock together and isn't gonna stretch as much. It, it can if you force it. Um, Somebody at my local yarn store, Nitty City, my favorite, loves love to Nitty City. Somebody the other day was talking about um, a friend who wound her yarn in a tight ball. Like she would take her yarn and wind it up and instead of doing it on a ball winder, um, which sort of makes those cakes. I have a cake. I have a cake right here. It's this nice cake. It's, you know, it's, it's squishy, which is good, which is what you want. Instead, this friend of hers would wind it tightly in a ball, you know, and I've, I've wound balls plenty too, but I, and then when I first started off, I did wind very tightly. The problem is that that keeps the yarn under tension and it sort of stretches out those fibers, which are meant to be kind of relaxed and chill and, and bouncy, right? It stretched them out and that is unkind to the fibers. Um, so definitely, you know, keep that in mind uh, when you are winding yarn, whether you do it by hand or on a winder, um, is to be, be gentle. Um, but the other part of the fiber thing and the lying swatches, the other thing to think about is if you're using superwash wool, the way that wool is treated to make it superwash, to make it not felt and not the scales not jumbled together, usually the scales are stripped off of the yarn. And that means it isn't as jumbly. It does tend to grow and stretch out, especially like in a single ply yarn. And I'm wearing this sweater today for, for that particular reason. This is my Kellynch cardigan um, from Jane Austen Knits. Uh, this is a sample I made for myself. Um, it is knit in a single ply. Uh, fingering weight yarn. It's very pretty. I like it a lot, but as you can see, it's longer than I expected. And I did 
so this was the second sample. This was a sample I knit for myself um, because the original sample for the magazine was kind of small. And I followed my, I, I had a swatch, you know, I knew what my gauge was supposed to be. And this is my gauge even locked, but it wasn't like lived in. And so I was doing, there's waist shaping in here. So, you know, I had a certain number of rows and whatever. And in the end, after I blocked it, it, it grew, it stretched out. It's fine. I still like the sweater a lot. I love the yoke. Um, but it was a, it was an object lesson in um, the, the issues of <laughs> super wash yarn, really. And especially a single ply. Um, I think the more plies, the more things are held together and that might make a more robust stitch. When there's just the single ply, it just kind of bloop, uh, especially in the super wash. So that is definitely something um, to bear in mind. And then this is non super wash. This is my, uh, this is in the Biche Bouche Petite Lambs Wall, which I love. I need to make another sweater in this. Um, very, very happy with this. This is, um, I always have to think, this is woolen spun. So this is the fibers were not brushed out to begin with. Um, they are jumbled and then they are spun together, jumbled, and it's just a two-ply. But I tell you, this sweater is light as air. It's just like, I don't even know how to tell you. Um, and so you can knit it at a slightly open gauge, which means, you know, not as many stitches jumbled together, pushed together. Um, in an inch because it was woolen spun those fibers all tend to it's like it's like a cloud it's like a halo and they tend to sort of support and reinforce each other whereas with um, my other fingering weight sweater I ended up this is like Oh, I can't remember the exact gauge right now. It's, it's all written down, but um, this is knit at a much tighter gauge. I had to, I went down a couple of needle sizes and you can see it's a much denser fabric. Can you see? Let's see. I think you can see now. You can see how far apart these stitches actually are, but they, again, with that sort of cloudiness of the fibers, the illusion is um, much more cohesive. Whereas this, I really did have to go down. Um, it's like at least eight stitches to the inch, I think. Um, and I discovered that while swatching, that I was much happier with this gauge up here on the top than this on the bottom. But of course, this makes it a heavier, denser sweater. There are just more stitches packed in per inch. Um, I'm going to be happy with it. I'm going to be happy that it is like three quarters sleeved. But... Um, but it's definitely, it's really funny. I'll, I'll weigh these at the end. I mean, they're different, you know, they're different style, but, but they're both technically, technically they're both considered light fingering weight yarns because you can pack a bunch of stitches with the Biche Bouche Petite Lambs Wool into that amount of space, but I chose not to. So, and of course those stitches support each other. I think I sort of said this earlier. Um, you know, everything, this is all interlocked. All those stitches, all that yarn, they're, they're connected. That's the point of the fabric. And the more there are together, the more they're sort of holding each other up, but the denser and heavier they'll be. So um, the woolen spun yarn can afford in this instance to be more generous and open and it kind of poofs up a little, um, for each stitch to make the, it a cohesive but very light fabric. Okay, so I think that's kind of answered all the questions. Does anybody else have anything um, to type on the side? Go ahead, because we still have a little bit of time. I kind of budgeted um, an hour, but we've done 35 minutes so far. Um, and I hope it's been helpful uh, and explanatory. I'm just gonna move this out of the way. Um, and I'm going to tell you our next few episodes. So, uh, just so you're prepared in case, um, you have any other questions and you can always ask me questions 
and I will do my best to answer them on upcoming episodes. I am going to record a few um, at once because I have some, some travel next month. Um, but next episode is going to be about color work techniques. And I'm, so I'm going to show you on screen how I do two color knitting. And I have experimented a little with doing it both on one. I think I've only done it both throwing. But I'll see if I can show you different ways to do that. Um, because it definitely, um, if you can get attention that you like, um, a gauge that's, that's relaxed enough, it can make go a lot faster when you use two hands. And it's also fun to you know, just switch back and forth. Um, and then there are some tools. I don't have any of them because I have, I do feel comfortable with what I'm doing, but I know that there's a little, it's like a little ring that goes around your finger and it's got two little loops. It's kind of like if you have a ball winder, you know, there's that metal coil uh, that you feed the yarn through. Um, it's kind of like those. And so then you can control the tension um, on either hand uh, um, more easily. So that's a good tool for people who, some people just can't do it with both hands. They're, the dominance of the colors um, becomes a problem because their gauges are so different going from uh, throwing to picking. Um, and they just, it's like, it's too hard to, to break it down. You know, you like do the Tiger Woods thing, break down your swing and build it back up again. But sometimes we just wanna be knitting and we wanna be knitting a thing and we wanna be happy with the finished product. So instead of doing that, breaking down the swing, like actually acknowledge what's going on and work with your comfort zone, which I think is good advice anyway. Like find what works for you and then continue to make that work, okay? <laughs> okay, so episode six will be some color work techniques. Um, uh, we'll talk about floats some more and hand dominance and um, the techniques for trapping and stuff like that so you can keep it all under control and smooth. And I'll just say now, the point of trapping is so that you don't have really long floats that you catch on your fingers. Um, generally, if a float is like less than an inch or about an inch, it shouldn't be a problem. Especially it won't be a problem if you are using the sticky woolen spun wool. Uh, those, the inside, the floats start to sort of mash together a little and that makes a smooth inside fabric which is also helpful um so that would be another reason to trap okay episode seven is going to be about techniques i will show you the provisional cast on that i use at the split um because it's a little different um perhaps than what you've used um so and i'll start about increases and decreases in um, directional knitting. Then episode eight will be, um, we'll talk more about the split once, then once you have that provisional technique, uh, provisional cast on technique, you can pursue that. Um, also gonna talk about customizing sleeve, sleeve circumference. One thing that some of my testers noticed on the unreathed pullover is that I wrote it to have sort of a, an oversized body like uh, to be a bigger circumference, but then to have the sleeves be more fitted because I felt like for me, fashion-wise, style-wise, that balanced it out. So it didn't just look like I was wearing my dad's sweater, you know. Um, it looked intentional, not like I just made a giant sweater. So, um, but that doesn't mean that the sleeve that I wrote is going to be comfortable for you. And the nice thing about top-down and especially having the color work end a little bit before we get to the point where we split is that there's room we can add some more increases there. Um, you can work up to a bigger sleeve size so that the sweater will feel good for you. And then as you're working top down, you can also, you can start the decreases later. Um, you can space them differently. Like if you know you want three quarter sleeves and I wrote it to be long, long sleeves and I have long arms. Um, then, you know, you are the boss. You can totally, um, can totally get on top of that and, um, and customize the sweater for you. You know, there's been a lot of talk about inclusivity, um, in knitting lately, which I think is awesome. 
I think everybody who wants to knit should be able to knit. And um, you're not any less of a knitter if you're using some yarn that somebody says isn't as good as some other yarn. Yarn's great. You know, some, you may like some yarn. Some people love alpaca. I tend to find alpaca itchy. Um, you may like bright colors. I may like natural dye or vice versa. I, I like all kinds of yarn. I, um, there's, so there's no wrong way to knit as we've learned, as I've tried to talk about. There are multiple ways to do pretty much every technique in knitting, which is cool. Like, <laughs> so, so everyone is welcome. Everyone should be at the party. It's too much fun to keep it to yourself and tell everyone else they're doing it wrong. Um, but one of the things I want to emphasize in terms of inclusivity is I want you to be the boss. If you are the boss of your knitting, if you know how you want to make, you are custom making your clothing. This is couture, okay? You're making your own custom item. I'm trying to give you the tools so that you can make it work for you. When knitters, when designers are writing patterns, what we need to do is to write patterns to show you, to tell you how we made the thing, okay? But that doesn't mean that you have to make the thing exactly that way. If you know that you have a longer torso, most people do have a longer torso than I do, then you should be able to make your torso longer. You should be able to customize your design. I can tell you the techniques um, and help you think about those things, but I want you to be able to do it because that makes you the boss of your knitting. And that's what we're here for. Um, so, you know, I tend to write my patterns in seven sizes. I try to be encompassing and inclusive, but of course there are tiny people or people who want to knit child versions of these sweaters. And then there are people who are even bustier and grander than I am. And I want everybody to be able to figure out how to take whatever patterns have, whatever information is in a pattern and extrapolate it and make it the right thing for them. Okay. So I'll be talking some more about that on uh, episode eight, which will be customizing things um, when you're doing the split for the sleeves and the body. Uh, Cause that's a great point. Hopefully by then you've got the, the top part the way you want it. And then you can customize it and make the rest of it, make all of it just right for you. Okay. Episode nine is going to be, I'm going to talk about direction and I'm going to talk about the fact that I'm more comfortable working bottom up and what the advantages are there and what the advantages are from top down that I have learned. So that should be fun. And again, I want to empower you to think about just because a sweater is written top down and you're more comfortable bottom up doesn't mean that you can't work it bottom up. Like start with the numbers that where the sweater ends and work your way back. It, like it, it should generally be doable, especially for things like a round yoke sweater. It's, it's very straightforward construction. Uh, it's a little more complicated when you get into things like say, seamless setting sleeves or um, uh, stuff like that and saddle shoulder and stuff. There, there are ways to do that. Um, I'm not, I haven't spent the time figuring out how to like reverse engineer a saddle shoulder sweater so you can work the top down, but I'm sure you can because again, like knitting can go either way. Okay. So that's direction. That's episode nine. Episode 10, we'll talk about finishing techniques. Um, the secret is there aren't as many techniques that you need when working a top-down seamless sweater. <laughs> but we'll talk about them and tools and um, stuff like that and anything else that has come up. Episode 11 will be blocking, and that's where we give our sweaters a bath and we stomp on them and all that kind of stuff. And then, of course, episode 12 will just be the finished object. Yay! So, um, so that is what's coming up. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for watching and listening. And uh, next week we will be back to our Tinkly Accordion music at the beginning and the end. But today I will just be signing off now. So thank you so much for being here. I hope you are happy with your knitting. Remember you are the boss of your knitting and I will see you next week. Thanks. Bye.